Welcome to the talk, Collaborating Over Mountaintop Mesh Networks. Uh, a lot of key words and uh, fun words that we'll get to unpack over the period of this talk. So I'm Jonathan Martin. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Nibbler. And I work at a company in Atlanta, Georgia. It's called Big Nerd Ranch, uh, giant geek farm if you prefer. So Big Nerd Ranch is a training and software development company based out of Atlanta. I work there as an instructor and software developer with our front end and back end. Uh, don't tell the back end team, but the front end is my personal favorite. Oh, and by the way, afterwards, uh, if you want to come find me, I do have Big Nerd Ranch swag, as in the big nerdy glasses, the little koozies for your drinks and that sort of thing. You don't get one. I didn't bring enough. <laughs> and you made me tr taste some funny desserts. So uh, I'm originally from Atlanta, which is how I got started at Big Nerd Ranch. But uh, I've been moving around a lot lately. So I was in Mobile, then I was in Dallas. So really nowadays, I work from anywhere. And uh, this is because I'm a digital nomad. Digital nomads are people who leverage technology to work from anywhere, which often means they travel a lot, which is uh, fine by me. Because uh, there's a lot of neat perks with being a digital nomad. You could get some really great views uh, on your morning commute, right? So this could be my view. Uh, OK, this was not actually my view. <laughs> no, thankfully, this was, this was vacation. That was a great view for vacation. But I mean, theoretically, as a digital nomad, this could be your view, right? And so this kind of lifestyle over the last two years has really allowed me to nurture my love for mountains and landscape photography. So all the pretty views in little towns and sorts of things are a little bit hard to see from the office. So I bring all of this up because digital nomads have uh, a lot of interesting problems and skill sets that technology is well suited to help with. Uh, there's a very interesting skill set you need to be a digital nomad. One is you just got to be good at last minute flights, especially when hurricanes kind of pay no heed to your itineraries. And you live out of a backpack a lot, a bunch of other interesting skills. But there's one main challenge that all digital nomads face, and that is hotel and McDonald's Wi Fi. This is pretty much the Wi Fi of nomads. Is you know, those awful little Wi-Fi portals you have to log into that disconnect every hour or so. So unfortunately, our Wi-Fi connection isn't so great, which we're, we're in the tech industry, right? We're supposed to be connected all of the time, so that way we can do all of our collaboration and stuff on the go. So digital nomads come from quite a few different industries, but they have a few things in common. Uh, so bloggers, journalists, software developers, uh, they tend to do a lot of writing and collaboration on the go. It might be on a flight, it might be on a taxi, it might be on a bus, which means that they're going to have really poor connectivity unless they're in the city center hanging out at a coffee shop. So they'll be offline a lot of the time. So there's a lot of interesting challenges that come when you're trying to write software that people like digital nomads can really benefit from. So in my personal quest, uh, to create really great software for digital nomads. We're going to focus on two fictional people. I, I couldn't find any good emoji that I liked to blow up to this size because they were also pixelated. So I thought I'd get something really pixelated, some random GitHub avatars. And so we're going to focus on these two people, Alex and Beth. There we go. So Alex is a foodie. He's really interested in food culture and tasting of different things around the world. And Beth is a travel journalist. Now, Alex and Beth are traveling together and they're traveling throughout the world, and uh, they have this really ambitious goal. They're interested in sandwiches. They want to see what, what sandwiches are like around the world, and they want to see what the history is like and how it changes from country to country. And uh, furthermore, they want, to be able to do, they want to be able to work on this incredible sandwich expose on the go wherever they are. Now, that could be in a coffee shop with great Wi-Fi, or that might be on top of a mountain like Half Dome in Yosemite National Park. There are not good Wi-Fi connections on top of mountains, right? Well, they want to be able to collaborate on things no matter where they are. So nowadays, what tools would we recommend to people like Alex and Beth? And I've got to fix this. Sorry. I'll try this once more. Otherwise, I'll switch the mic. Sorry. So what kind of tools would we recommend for Alex and Beth, you know, if they want to be able to collaborate on the go and they know that connectivity is going to be very poor. Well, as developers, we would probably uh, say that something like a version control system like Git might be a really good option. Well, I've tried to sell a lot of writers on this, tried to sell a lot of family members on Git as well. It's an interesting challenge. Uh, the biggest one being they change one word and you get this big ugly diff. What writer wants to see this, right? 
Uh, furthermore, it's a command line tool. What writer is going to use a command line tool? And yes, there are great GUIs out there, but they all tend to be very bloated for what most writers want to be able to use. And it's definitely not real time. Uh, you, let's see, you do git add, git commit, git push, and then you do a git pull. Yeah, that's real time. So most writers don't go with git. They go with something like Google Docs, right? It's great because it's real time. It gives you some limited formatting. It's really easy to share with multiple people. So Google Docs are pretty cool, you know, unless this is a problem. So if, unless you have the offline version of Google Docs downloaded, you're not going to be able to get the app in the first place. If you were diligent and happened to download the offline version and enable offline mode, it's not very resilient when you're offline for very long. And furthermore, what if Alex and Beth are right next to each other? I mean, what if they're on top of a the mountain, they've both got their laptops out? Why can't they collaborate right there? Well, it's because it's all on Google servers. You have to have an internet connection to Google to do that. So Google Docs, meh. Nah. And then uh, the nerdier folks among us might know of something like Etherpad, which does let you collaborate if you're in the same area. It uses Bonjour or Bluetooth, some of these local peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity options. The problem is the only reason you know about Etherpad is if you are a nerd. So you're probably not going to sell many of your writer friends on a plain text editor that's a little bit dated. So our goal is to help facilitate offline and real-time collaboration for our writer duo, Alex and Beth. And thankfully, we have the tools as developers, we have the algorithms to make software for people, not necessarily just digital nomads, but really anyone who is struggling with poor connectivity and they want to be able to collaborate anywhere on the go. We have the tools for it. Unfortunately, most of it is hidden in academic research papers. Say la vie. So we have some really great algorithms. There's three basic parts that we need to create experiences, like a really great editor for digital nomads. Now, it doesn't just have to be text. It could be music, actually. Uh, for some of you uh, music composition nerds, you might be familiar that there are text languages that you can write your sheet music in. Well, you could collaborate with that sort of thing. So you could imagine that musicians, composers, digital nomads, writers, etc., could all use these kinds of tools. So those three basic parts that we need to create a great experience for digital nomads and friends. The first is the most complicated part, and this will make up the bulk of the talk, which is the conflict resolution algorithm. This is what allows Alex and Beth to work on things in isolation and then come back together, get on Wi-Fi, and suddenly everything just syncs up automatically. They don't even have to think about it. This is the most complicated part, so we'll spend most of the talk here. But obviously for this to work, there has to be some way for Alex and Beth to create a, a connection with each other. In particular, it'd be really cool if Alex, Beth, or Chris, and Daniel, up to you know, all these different people, to be able to collaborate if they're all in the same area without having a central server. That would be pretty cool. So we need a really good network for propagating these changes to peers. And then last, we've got to have a really nice editor. I mean, these are writers and authors. They probably don't want to be able to hit Command Option I and get developer tools and go on Facebook and panic about it. So let's focus on that first part, which is how do we merge changes for eventual consistency? Now, what do I mean by eventual consistency? Some of you might know this uh, from database paradigms, but um, in web development, we have a fundamental limit, and that is the speed of light is slow. I mean, it's the fastest thing that we have, but it's still slow. If you're on one side of the nation and the other side of the globe, it still takes a while to get messages across. And so that means that if Alex and Beth are working on something, Alex doesn't want to have to wait around for Beth to finish making her changes just so he can start making his. Alex would really like to go ahead and make his changes proactively and then let the software merge those changes. This is why Basecamp message editing is such a pain. You have to wait turns. Turn taking is for children. We're developers. We're past this. So for Alex and Beth to be able to make changes simultaneously, we need a really good algorithm that will merge these changes without supervision. But how it merges those changes has to be very predictable, it has to be very consistent. In particular, if Alex and Beth are working on the same document, even if they make changes and those changes don't get propagated for a while, it is required that at the end of the day, once those changes are synced up, Alex and Beth must end up with the exact same copy of the document. If it diverges, then we violate the principle of eventual consistency. 
Eventual consistency is a principle taken from a database paradigm. You might be familiar with ACID versus BASE type, uh, type databases. Well, the E in BASE is eventual consistency. In particular, we're talking about strong eventual consistency. So eventual consistency is a constraint, and it requires that instead of two people having the exact same co copy of the document at all times, it just requires that once all changes have been synced, that Alex and Beth end up with the exact same copy of the document. So it's a little bit of a relaxation of the typical ACID constraints. So we're gonna look at some scenarios um, and apply some of these algorithms. So in particular, Alex and Beth are grocery shopping. They're in an alpine village, probably in the mountains somewhere, probably without a great Wi-Fi connection at that. And so naturally, Alex and Beth need a grocery list. They need something that they can collaborate on. They need essentially a set. So we're gonna start with something really simple. Alex and Beth start out together. They work out a nice grocery list and they decide, you know what, I'd really like to have milk, bread, and eggs. Admittedly not the best picnicking food, but you know. And so Alex and Beth decide to uh, separate ways for a little bit so they can go looking for grocery stores. So while they're isolated, they decide to make changes to the grocery list secretly. Alex decides that he really doesn't want bread. He's not big on sandwiches, despite working on a sandwich expose. And he decides he'd like some apples. And Beth decides she doesn't want milk. So when Alex and Beth come back together, they need to reconcile these changes. They need to end up with the exact same copy of the document. So we started out with milk, bread, and eggs. What solutions might we use to merge these changes? Well, there's two naive solutions we might do. The first is we might just merge these uh, we might merge Alex and Beth's list by taking every single item and combining them. In other words, doing a union between the two sets. Now, this is a viable solution because on both Alex and Beth's machine, once the changes have been synced, they'll end up with the exact same grocery list. So this is a viable algorithm. We could do the inverse, which would be intersection. So that way, we only keep the items which are present in both of their grocery lists. So both of these are viable solutions. But we might ask, what on earth happens with the changes Alex made to bread and apples? In particular, let's come back to this. Notice that at the beginning, we started with milk, bread, and eggs. And then Alex removed bread but added apples. Well, if we look at our two naive solutions, we see that neither of these solutions preserves both of those intentions. The solution on the left did not remove bread, but it did add apples, OK, 50-50. The solution on the right did remove bread, but it didn't add apples. So neither solution is smart enough. It seems like we're losing some intentions here, but we uh, intuitively know that, hey, Alex was trying to remove something, he wanted to add something. Beth wanted to just remove something. It seems like we should be able to do a better job. So maybe instead of encoding final state, we should keep track of the operations, the changes that were made to these lists. So in this case, Instead of storing the final state, we'd store that, hey, Alex deleted bread and he added apples. And then we would track that Beth removed milk. Then what we could do is we could merge these operations into one big set, and now we can run these one after another on our grocery list. So if we do that, we end up with a much more reasonable solution. So if we remove bread, we add apples, and then we remove milk, we end up with eggs and apples. Now, if you think through this and you think of the changes Alex and Beth made, you'll notice that this is much more consistent with Alex's intentions and Beth's intentions. So this algorithm is much better for our grocery set, our grocery list. It preserves our intentions. But unfortunately, picnics don't last forever. So Alex and Beth have finished their grocery shopping. They've already had their picnic. Now they're ready to work on some real work, which is their blog about sandwiches. It's going to be something really incredible, probably a little bit like this at the end of their little journey, but they've got to start somewhere. They're going to start very simply with just the word sandwich. So we're going to talk about how you can collaborate on a string. So they both start off with the same document. This is consistency. Alex and Beth have to start off with the same thing. And they're going to be making some changes in isolation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and add indices up here underneath those characters, just so we can reference those a little bit later. So Alex and Beth have separated. So they're isolated right now. They're going to make changes concurrently. They don't know about the changes the other has made. So first, Alex removes a letter. He removes the letter D. 
And then Beth, in complete isolation, without knowing anything that Alex did, is going to insert the letter H. So we have two very interesting spellings of sandwich, sandwich and sandwich. Now, if we want to, Alex and Beth come back together and they want to resolve these changes, well, what we might do is just model this as operations like we just did with sets. So instead, we're going to have our, a delete operation and an insert operation. So this says that Alex deleted the character at index three. That would be the letter D. Beth inserted a letter H at index five. Now, right now, both Alex and Beth's operations are modeled in terms of the full word sandwich at the very top. Keep that in mind. So now we're going to run both of these changes and see what we end up with. Okay, so we move the letter D at index three, and then after that, we add in the letter H. So we end up with sandwichicha. So that's not quite what we wanted. It seems like Beth was trying to add the letter H after the letter W, not the letter I. Well, this is, the problem is that when we tried to run Alex's operation, he changed the state that we were working with. Beth's operation was in terms of the full word sandwich. But since we ran Alex's change first when we were trying to resolve these conflicts, the state changed. So maybe we can be a little bit more clever. Maybe Alex, after he deletes the, the uh, character at index three, notice that when he deletes that character, everything shifts over one letter. So now we have an offset of negative one. Well, now what we could do is if we're going to run Beth's operation, we can offset it by negative one. So instead of inserting the letter H at index five, we insert it in index four. And now we get sandwich, or sandwich. Seems a little bit more reasonable. It's a little crazy spelling. So in a nutshell, this is operational transforms. The key observation being that whenever operations are performed concurrently, you can't apply them one after another because the state is different every time. So instead, every time you go to apply an operation that was made concurrently, you transform it in terms of the previous operation. So this is operational transforms. It's a very popular algorithm. It's probably the number one uh, conflict resolution algorithm out there. I mean, pretty much everyone out there uses operational transforms. There's a lot of great libraries out there. Now, for operational transforms to work, there's two properties it has to meet. They're called TP1 and TP2, transformation property one and transformation property two. Very inventive, very creative. Thanks, Wikipedia. So TP1 and TP2 are basically a bunch of ugly looking math. This maybe doesn't make a ton of sense, but we've got pictures. So here's TP1. So if you look at this diagram, this is saying what happens when Alex and Beth start with the same state and then they make changes and then they tell each other about those changes. Well, in this case, in our naive algorithm, they end up with two completely docu different documents. Alex ends up with AXC, Beth ends up with, with ACX. So TP1 requires that this problem not be a problem. So if you have a good operational transformation algorithm, it will prevent this situation. But that's just TP1. TP2 is far more complex. TP2 says, what happens when there are three collaborators? What happens if you have Alex, Beth, and Chris? Alex and Chris add a letter to the document, and Beth removes a letter that was kind of a pivot. It's kind of in the middle of where Alex and Chris were adding their characters. How do we determine which solution it is? Is it A, X, Y, C? or is it A, Y, X, C? So for an algorithm to be TP2 compliant, it has to solve this problem. This problem is a lot more difficult. So in fact, for text documents, there are no, currently, there are no correct transformation functions, which means that operational transforms cannot be used to build a decentralized editor. Or in other words, operational transforms cannot be used to create a peer-to-peer -peer editor. You have to have a central server that transforms operations between those peers. That's essentially what Google Docs is. It's a really lame, non-peer-to-peer -peer syncing algorithm. Hey, it works really well. But since operational transforms only supports two peers, Google server always has to be in the middle. It essentially acts as one peer, and you're the other peer. And if you want to have more people working on the document, they have to go through Google to get their operations transformed. So that way, it's like there's only ever two peers. 
Now, unfortunately, since it has to go through Google's server, that means that it's going to be slow, it's going to be centralized, so you have to have an internet connection to Google's server at all times. So, yeah, Google Docs. Can we do better? We can actually do a little bit better. There's a large class of algorithms that rely on something called preconditions and tombstones. We'll start off with preconditions. So to explain this, I'm going to show you a bit of notation. This notation is borrowed from set order notation. All it means is that the letter S must come before the letter A, which must come before the letter N. And so another way that you could think of this is this says that A has to come after the letter S and it has to come before a letter N. Basically, it's a set of conditions or requirements. So if we go back to our string sandwich, we could actually write this out as in ordering. So this says that the letter S has to come before the, the letter A, comes before the letter N, etc. Now, if you've come from a computer science background, you might recognize this as a partially ordered set or a post set. In this case, it's a post set with a total ordering which means it's basically just an array. It's laid out from left to right. So let's say that we have three people working on this document. They're all in isolation, so these are all concurrent changes. And Chris decides to delete a letter, Alex decides to insert a letter, and Beth also inserts a letter. So if we want to resolve these changes, we could just try to run these one after another. So to run the delete operation, we delete the D that was between an N and W. So those were sort of preconditions. And so then, let's see, we want to apply the insert. Oh, no, we can't apply that. There's no D anymore. So if we tried to insert the Y, we have the W, but we don't have a D. So we don't know where to put this letter. So one thing that we could do is instead of deleting letters, we could just mark them as deleted at some point in time. These are called tombstones. Tombstones are just markers that, hey, there used to be a letter here. So now if I want to run my insert operation, and I want to insert a Y between D and W, now I can see, oh, hey, there used to be a D there. Someone else deleted it, but hey, I'll, I'll go ahead and use that for my context. So we can run that operation, and then we can easily run the other one. We just make sure that the E goes between the D and the W. It can go before or after the Y. And we end up with yet another permutation of sandwich. So the only problem with this is those tombstones. In our case, we only had one tombstone. But you can imagine that when you're editing a document, you can end up with a lot of tombstones. And every tombstone takes up memory. So you could have a document that's only about three characters or so, but it could be several megabytes large because you have all of this deletion history. So tombstones aren't quite that great either. They're not always very performant. Can we do better? We can. So now we get to kind of the creme de la creme, which is CRDTs. CRDTs, conflict-free replicated data types, it's a class of data types which naturally resolve conflicts without any special transformation algorithm. So operational transforms, while they're easy to understand, are very difficult to implement in practice because there are so many edge cases to think through. CRDTs, it's like a data structure that magically resolves conflict. Now CRDTs are a class, which means there's a CRDT for a counter, for a list, for a set, etc. So in particular, we're interested in one called LSEQ, which is a, a linear sequence. Essentially, it's just an array, but it's a very, very efficient array that can resolve conflicts. So let's say that we have our string sandwich. There's a lot of ways we could represent this in memory on a computer. We might represent it as an array of characters. But uh, in a lot of programs, we tend to use tree structures to store data, like a binary tree in this case. So tree structures have a lot of very useful properties in regards to performance and memory usage. So the LSEQ CRDT type in particular is a very special kind of exponential tree. So this tree has a root node at the very top. That's the purple root node at the top. And it can have up to 10 branches. Just as an example, you can actually pick that number. And each branch is labeled from 0 to 9. The 0 and 9 branches are reserved usually for the beginning and end of a string. Um, but all the others can be used in between. And then each subtree follows those same rules. So under the root node, we have 0 through 9 from left to right. And then under the S and C nodes, you'll notice it also follows those same rules of being labeled from 0 to 9. So there's several levels in this tree. You'll notice that at each level, it could kind of be used as an address for one of these nodes. So if I wanted to address the node D, I could say, hey, go to level or um, go to branch 377, 
or we might notate this as 3.7.7. .7. So if I wanted to do an insert operation, let's say I want to insert a new letter into my document, instead of giving it an index, you give it one of these special paths. These paths are actually considered IDs. They're immutable IDs. They'll never be, um, they'll never be changed over time, and they'll never be conflicting. So in particular, we're going to insert a Y between 3.7.7 .7 and 3.8. If you look at those in the tree, that's inserting a Y between the D and the W. And when we do that, this insert operation returns a new node for us. This node is for the letter Y, and it, uh, it automatically assigned us a brand new address that is between 3.7.7 .7 and 3.8. It's 3.7.9. So if we wanted to add this node to our new tree, it's really easy. We go back to our tree, and we go down the tree. We see 3, 7, and then we see, oh, under the A node, we don't have a branch for 9. Whoopee, let's add, let's add this new node. And so all we do is add that new node. And now if you were to traverse this tree, if you did, a, a, in particular, a depth-first search, where every time you touch a node, you print out that character, this would print out something like Sandy Witch. So if Alex and Beth make changes concurrently at the same time, we actually don't have to worry about solving any conflicts. We just do these insertions. So if Alex added the letter Y at 379, we just add it. And then if Beth added the letter H at 3.8.2, we just add it. And then when we traverse the tree, we get Sandy Witch. So there was no transformation operation. There was no special kind of logic we had to do here. The data type itself resolves conflicts. So CRDTs are very appealing for this reason. They're very, um, they're very intellectually simple. And there's a lot of incredible advantages, in particular, to LSEQ. It works with multiple peers. This is something operational transforms, except for one obscure version of the algorithm, cannot do. You can't have Alex, Beth, and Chris all on top of a mountain talking to each other without a middleman. Well, you can with LSEQ. Alex, Beth, and Chris can all send operations directly to each other. And this means you don't need a master pair. There's no tombstones to worry about. So memory usage doesn't grow very quickly. That's also very useful. And operations can be applied very quickly because it's a tree structure. So on average, you can apply an insertion or a deletion in log time. And also, because of the nature of a CRDT in this particular example, it's resilient to long offline spells. You've probably been in Google Docs before where you made changes offline for too long, and then it said, hey, I actually can't merge these changes. I'm going to just drop them altogether. Or luckily, it'll save you a version sometimes. Well, CRDTs are much more resilient to those types of long offline scenarios. They're still not perfect, but they tend to be much more predictable to users. So there's a, so a JavaScript implementation up. I'll have these slides up if you want to check these links um, for the LSEQ tree. This is a guy who wrote a really great research paper in particular on the LSEQ algorithm and how to do it efficiently. There were a lot of algorithms before that did um, CRDT strings, but they were very inefficient. And a uh, fellow JS Comper actually just mentioned, um, there's a new paper that came out just two months ago about a CRDT specifically for a limited subset of JSON documents. So if you want CRDTs for something that's shaped more like a tree, there's a data structure for it. Um, I haven't yet found a JavaScript implementation of it. All I've found is an implementation in this obscure language called Scala. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. So I'm told you can transpile things. So we're going to breeze through this. Uh, a lot of you probably saw the mountaintop mesh networks and thought this would be the bulk of the talk. Started diving into it. This was the most boring part of the whole talk. So I'm going to breeze through this, which is now that we've got an algorithm for resolving these conflicts, we need a way for Alex and Beth to all be communicating to each other automatically. There's a lot of difficult parts, though, to a peer-to-peer -peer network. And the four hardest parts in particular, topology, which says, how do these peers connect to each other in a resilient way so that if one of them goes offline, the world doesn't die? Discovery, which is, how do these peers discover each other in the first place? Transport, which is, how do they exchange messages efficiently and in a way that is um, error resistant. And then security, how do we make sure someone isn't tampering with these operations? So here, for example, is a sample network topology. This is Alex and Beth, they're on top of a mountain. They have a lot of hiking friends. So 
Uh, this isn't a great topology because if any one of these connections between the peers goes down, well then great, Alex can't send a message to Beth. A better network topology would be something like this, where everyone has a few connections to some diverse neighbors. That way, if one or two connections gets a little bit spotty, we still can send a message from Alex to Beth. Now, unfortunately, it's sometimes very difficult to automatically create networks that are shaped like this. But there are algorithms out there. So for the most part, we can just assume that, hey, Alex can send a message to Beth. Eventually, Beth receives a message, possibly many times, actually. So those of you who come from an internet works or IT background might recognize some of these problems and realize that we're basically reinventing how the internet works, or TCP IP, for that matter. TCP IP handles congestion control for us. It handles rerouting. It handles sending packets that fail to deliver. Well, you need all of that for a peer-to-peer -peer network. So that's a royal pain to start from scratch. So thankfully, some other people have done that for us. Again, the, these slides will be up if you want to look more into this. The last one in particular, this is one that intrigues me, is libp2p, which tries to handle only the connection part of peer-to-peer. -peer. It doesn't try to handle replicating data types or anything between peers. It just tries to handle how do I automatically connect to peers, how do I discover them, and how do I relay messages in sort of a gossip style. So all that stuff is up there. And if you wanted to see just a really incredible list of all things peer-to-peer, -peer, also this great list. So I have completely overrun my time. So I only get to show you the demo for like a brilliant five seconds. That's OK. It's about sandwich history anyway. It's incredibly interesting. So this last part was creating a really awesome, oh. Uh, apparently, it likes that. So uh, if you want to come see the demo, I'll be, out, I'll be outside the room, and I'll have it up. Hopefully, it won't be flashing. It's just the editor showing off the really nice hinting and stuff. All this code is up on GitHub, also in the slides. So thank you for coming out today. Thank you for helping Alex and Beth do some wonderful things and be able to actually write something without having to go read academic papers for a living. So if you're interested in anything digital nomad related, travel adventures, or you just like pretty pictures, please check out my website, yellowscale.com, where you can find me on Twitter at Nibbler. And uh, I have swag from Big Nerd Ranch. That's all. <laughs>